Welcome back to The Dr. Doug Show, your resource for bone health, hormone optimization, and health span. So we're always looking for a better way to determine bone quality, right? We know it's pretty clear that bone density is not the full picture. DEXA is flawed. Quality is at least 50% of the picture, but how do you know your bone quality? We've talked about REMS. That's an option if you can find one or are close to one. TBS is something that you can tack on to um, a DEXA and you can potentially get some benefit, but that has flaws too. So isn't there a better option? Well, have you heard of bone score? I've had patients coming to me saying that they got a biopsy of their bone and there's probably different ways to do biopsy depending on which academic center you go to. But there's a commercial product called Bone Score that's been uh, sent to me and I wanted to explore this uh, with our audience because I think we're gonna get more and more questions about it. So this is a potential way to uh, look at bone quality, which is kind of cool. So stick around. I'm gonna walk you through what the device is, show you how it's used, discuss the evidence supporting it at kind of a high level, not to get too in, in depth here, but I really wanna deliver my thoughts on it as an orthopedic surgeon um, who's treated a lot of bone injuries and bone infections, uh, what the potential risks are of this. And also, if you find value in this content, please click that subscribe button. The more people that click that button, the more people we can help. All right, I'll see you in a minute. Three, two, one. All right, so what is the bone score? Well, the bone score is a device that was developed uh, by a company that received FDA approval in 2021. So it hasn't been around very long in the United States, but it's been around in Europe for much longer. And it's kind of cool. They use a device that is essentially what they call an osteoprobe, and it measures bone mineral density, kind of. I'll walk you through what I mean by that. It gives you an objective score. And honestly, when I first saw it, I thought, man, this is pretty cool. So I went to their website and it's well designed. It's got data for patients. It's got data for physicians. It's got a whole bunch of research stuff and it's got some videos on how it works. So I was super intrigued and I really wanted to bring this to our audience. So actually, let me just go ahead and show you how it works. And I think this will help to uh, lay the groundwork for what I wanna show you later in the research. So we're gonna go ahead and play this video here. And we're gonna pick it up a couple of seconds in. All right, so what you're looking at here is that they are injecting some lidocaine around the skin. You can see they've marked their site. What they did there with the vertical lines was to mark out the front part or the anterior aspect of the tibia. They laid a sterile drape over it, and now they're gonna uh, put a sterile um, kind of tube over the uh, probe itself. And she's wearing sterile gloves. And so now you can see that she's actually percutaneously going through what she anesthetized and she's putting the needle on the bone. So she's right on the front part of the tibia. And I don't know if you can appreciate this in the video, but essentially she's kind of pushing down and it sort of has like a telescopic motion to it. And it's taking little punches of the bone. So it's actually penetrating into the bone and it gives some kind of feedback there on um, the bone quality based off of this. All right, so when I look at this video, my background again as an orthopedic surgeon, specifically lower extremity, where I dealt with a lot of tibial infections, a lot of uh, you know people that had bad outcomes from doing injections, not from me, from other people, where even a percutaneous incision or a small incision with percutaneous procedure like that has led to complications, whether it be a local infection or my, my real concern here is a deep bone infection. And so depending on what population you're doing this in, particularly if they have diabetes, if they're smoker, if they have other you know, vascular comorbidities, the potential risk of this procedure is not small. Um, in a young, healthy person like they show in the video, probably gonna be just fine. But that person also isn't who you really wanna screen for osteoporosis and bone quality issues. So I, I have some concerns there, and I've actually showed this video and, and product to a couple of other individuals, and they sort of felt the same way, where a little cringe-worthy to look at uh, the idea of sticking that into somebody's tibia. Um, but let's just assume that the risk isn't too high. So let's just put that on the shelf for a second. Let's actually look at how good is it at giving us additional information. So like I said, their website's great. It has fantastic research on it. There's a tremendous number of papers, mostly out of Europe, but that's okay. Um, tremendous number of papers looking at the device and how it relates to osteoporosis. So let's take a look at a few of these. 
All right, so I pulled this first study from their website, and this is a review study, and actually it's a, a systematic review of many studies looking at this particular procedure. So let's just go over a couple of the, the terms here. So they use the term IMI, or impact microindentation. And what they're talking about here is that device and how it's, when it telescopes down, it's actually indenting the bone. So it's actually, uh, you know, kind of punching a hole in the bone, seeing what the bone does in response, and it's measuring that. So that's kind of cool. They also talk about BMSI. So they're talking about bone material strength index, bone material strength index, BMSI. So this is what they're actually using as the term of quality. So they're, they're saying that it's the material strength, the quality of the bone is what they're actually trying to measure. So what they go on to say in this re systematic review is that the main outcome of the studies was not always concordant between studies, meaning that they weren't always showing the same thing. They didn't always show what the um, investigators were trying to show, meaning that not all the studies show that there was a benefit in using it. They also showed that there were a number of factors that impacted the BMSI, bone material strength index outcome. You know, there's a lot of external factors that may have played a role in how this thing uh, performed. So then they go on to say that the systematic review does confirm that there's added value of the procedure for the evaluation and follow-up of bone fragility, but particularly in secondary osteoporosis. So secondary osteoporosis meaning caused by some other um, disease process, whether it be corticosteroids or thyroid dysfunction or parathyroid, whatever. So secondary osteoporosis, maybe there's more value. But they said that the high variability of BMSI outcome between studies calls for more studies, basically is what they said. So this review doesn't really sound real promising. So we looked into with a little bit more depth into some of the bigger studies using this out of Europe before the FDA approval. All right, so the second study is on 90 individuals. And this is a study that, again, looked at this bone microindentation, or the IMI is what they called it. And they were looking at this type of bone material strength, is what they called it in this study, the same as the what I was just mentioning in the other. And what they found was kind of interesting here. So it found that the bone material strength was significantly inversely related to age, indicating that older individuals have lower bone material strength, which kind of makes sense. The study also found that there was no significant relationship between bone material strength and bone mineral density, meaning that they are measuring different things. So that I like. Bone material strength was also comparable in patients with osteoporosis and those with osteopenia, indicating it's relevant. And I agree that it's relevant, but I also don't like the fact that it doesn't necessarily tell between the two. But again, it's different than bone mineral density, so maybe that's okay. And then they go on to say that patients with a history of fragility fracture had significantly lower bone material strength compared to those without fractures. So it has the potential to identify individuals at risk. Now, I have a little bit of an issue with that statement because you could say that they're associated, but it doesn't actually show that it's predictive. And so we already know that they have low bone density if they've had fragility fractures, so that doesn't really help. The question is, is if you did this procedure and it was as low, have they not had a fracture yet? Or does it, is it a lagging indicator, right? So is it a leading or is it lagging? If it's leading, meaning that this goes down and then you have a fracture, cool. But if it goes down only after you've had a fracture, it's not particularly helpful. They also found a significant association between lower material strength and higher odds of fracture independent of BMD. So now they're saying, well, it is potentially predictive. It's compelling to say that maybe we could use this, but they didn't have enough people to show that it was that powerful of a predictive tool. They also suggest in here that alterations in bone material properties can contribute to bone fragility independent of bone mineral density. Again, they're just saying this is, this is a quality thing. They didn't talk about side effects, risks, any complications. And one of the things that I did notice in this study, and this is consistent with other studies that I reviewed too, is that the difference between the groups, meaning the groups uh, that had had fractures and the groups that hadn't, with that objective measure, the difference was very small. And that's a little concerning to me. And that might be what they were talking about in the first study, that it's not really consistent. And you would have to have a pretty big group to show a difference that's consistent if the difference is pretty small. So you need big studies to show that difference that's the really small that could potentially show that there's benefit uh, in predicting fracture. The other thing that this particular study points out too is that if you are going to have multiple variables like operator variables, um, you know, other 
things are going to impact the bone, whether it be you know, with the person that you're doing it on or the person doing it or the test itself. If the difference is small, those variables are going to make a really big difference. And so, again, it's just a little bit concerning. I haven't seen enough evidence to say that this really makes sense for me. But before we get to the conclusion, let me just mention that if you are having a hard time putting together all of the different pieces of your bone health program, consider checking out our free bone health masterclass. We run this about every two to three weeks. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, just go to the description below. You can click on the link and register there. If you're listening to this as a podcast, go to drdouglucas.com and you can register for it there as well. All right, so does this device make sense? Does the bone score for me, does it, does it make my list of top things that I wanna do to identify if someone is at risk of fracture? I think the answer is probably no, but let me just give you an example. So for most people, I don't think we need it. Because we have DEXA for all of its benefits and all of its negatives. REMS is becoming more and more available. So we get a picture of quality there. And then ultimately, it doesn't necessarily change what we do. The only time I'm really using DEXA and T-score and quality is deciding how aggressive we need to be. Should we be considering pharmaceutical management? And for me, my threshold is so much, I guess, higher, um, depending on how you look at it. But my threshold for pharmaceutical management is so high that for the vast majority of people that I'm seeing, it wouldn't make a difference because we're not going to use it anyway. It potentially could encourage us to be more aggressive with other things too, encouraging people to do more things. Um, but overall, I think that it's probably not going to be relevant for most of our patients. But I just had a patient this week uh, where maybe it would have made a difference. So let me just explain it. So this was a 63-year-old patient and she was really surprised when she got a DEXA and had a T-score of negative five. That's super duper low. And she was even more surprised when she went to get her REMS and the T-score on REMS was negative 1.3. And her fragility score was not terrible. So when I see these huge discrepancies, we don't really know which one to believe. Both REMS and DEXA have the potential for error. So which one's right? Maybe neither. Maybe she's somewhere in the middle. She did also though have a history of fracture, multiple vertebral fractures. So we know that probably the DEXA was closer to right than the REMS. And that's actually the first time I've ever seen that. So in this case, would the bone score have helped us to determine what to do? I don't think so. Because for her, we already know that she's had fragility fractures. She has very low bone density and, and she's at risk for a new fracture, right? So we need to be very cautious with her. We had a conversation around pharmaceuticals. She adamantly doesn't want to use them. That's why she's working with us. So would the bone score have changed that for me? Probably not right? If it says that it's low, that's not surprising. If it says that it's not low, also not surprising because we have tests on either side, but we're still going to do pretty much all the things that we're going to do for her um, outside of pharmaceuticals because she doesn't want to do it. Let's just use the same example, but then let's just take out the fact that she's had fractures. So let's say that this same person with very low T-score on DEXA and, and not bad T-score on REMS, let's say she hasn't had fractures. So now it's kind of a different situation, right? So now we actually think that maybe her bone quality is pretty good. She reports that she's had some falls. She hasn't had a fracture. How could that be true with a T-score negative five? And, and these are the confusing uh, conversations that we get into. So in that case, would it make a difference? Maybe, right? Maybe we do that test and we see that, boy, she is really at risk of having a fracture based on this objective bone score score. You know, would she do anything different? I don't know. Uh, but that's a scenario where maybe it's an option. But again, as a surgeon who's treated bone infections, tibial bone infections are miserable for everybody involved. Take a very, very long time to heal and in the wrong patient can result in an amputation. So uh, I take incisions around the tibia very, very uh, not lightly. Um, I think that it's, um, you just have to be careful, even a tiny little thing like that. You know, I've seen uh, infected joints from a steroid injection, which should be a zero infection type of procedure. Anytime you put something through the skin, there's a risk that bacteria goes with it, even under the best circumstances. So I just get really nervous around sticking things in the tibia. Maybe that's just me. Actually, it's not just me. I know other, other orthopedic surgeons in the bone health space who feel the same way. So I don't think for the most part, it's going to change what we do. In the traditional medical model, it might actually make a difference. If somebody had a good score, it might dissuade a doctor from using a pharmaceutical than not. But again, the threshold is pretty darn low in the traditional medical model, but I don't know that it would actually make a difference there either. So, all right, 
This video was a review of this thing called the bone score. If you liked it, you may consider looking at our video on REMS. You can look at that one here. Um, there's another video called alternative testing options from DEXA, and you can look at that one here. Um, both of those will get you kind of further down the path of figuring out how bad your bone health is and other things that you could potentially do outside of DEXA to measure both bone density and bone quality. So that's it. My friends, remember that you are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Don't be afraid to be extraordinary because you are, and that's what it takes. I'll see you in the next video. This presentation is for general informational purposes only, does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this presentation are at the user's own risk. The content in this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.